Um, but appreciate everybody coming out today uh, to talk about an arc of an attack. And uh, you know, when we're coming up to this concept, there's a lot of things that you, you might hear in the news and talk about when it comes to understanding uh, offense and defense. And, and, and really we, what we wanted to do today is, is bring both of our companies together, Binary Defense and Trusted Sec, uh, to talk about what we see on the offense, uh, what we see from an incident response perspective, and what we see from uh, the understanding around specific threats and attacks that we have. So you're gonna hear from a lot of our folks that are in, in, uh, in the trenches day in and day out. In fact, uh, Tyler here, uh, was, uh, called me up at 10 o'clock last night, and he's like, hey, I need to get into the office. Can you shut the alarm off uh, so that uh, and I, I can go get some hard drives because we have a, a customer that had a breach. And so uh, he was up till 4 a.m. Uh, responding to a specific incident and is here this morning. So he's a little bit tired and drinking a whole bunch of coffee um, as we sit here. So, uh, But uh, you know, I really, uh, really uh, appreciate everybody coming out uh, today to talk. Uh, just uh, some, some things that we see today, uh, and, and just to kind of kick it off here, when you look at, at a lot of the breaches that we see out there today, uh, just in general, it's usually the basics that are kicking our butts. Um, it's it's the, the weak passwords, it's the lack of two-factor authentication in certain locations, it's vulnerability management, it's a lot of these different areas that, that really uh, I think a lot of companies struggle with uh, to get their hands around because it's, it's some of the hardest things to address. You look at vulnerability management, for example, and, and usually one of the, the biggest and most baddest words inside of a company is what we call a CMDB. Um, you know, being able to understand all of your assets and where they're at, being able to understand their versioning, uh, being able to have a process in place that you can do that. Um, and vulnerability management ends up being one of the easiest ways that we typically break in. If you look at some breach statistics, um, there's an article from Dark Reading. If you look at the PCI data breach reports, um, most breaches that occurred last year occurred from a CVE that was six months or older, uh, which means that, hey, it was an exploit that had already been published for six months or a misconfiguration that had already been uh, 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 identified six months prior and that led to a specific uh, and major breach. And so a lot of these main areas that we see most folks getting compromised with are due to weak passwords. Uh, password management is a, is a main, main cause there. Uh, there's a lot of organizations that, that you know, really struggle with passwords, and I, you know, I think I can say that I wish passwords would just die in a burning fire, um, but they're not going away anytime soon. Uh, Microsoft, interesting enough, um, said that next year they're announcing the, 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 the destruction of passwords in their environments where they're going to facial recognition uh, and they're doing a lot of other technology. So, I think in the next 20 or 30 years, maybe we'll see in our lifetime passwords dying, but I don't see that happening uh, anytime soon. Uh, but when it comes to the certain ways that we break in, oftentimes, uh, a lot of data breaches from like the LinkedIn data breach from 2013, uh, a lot of the newer data breaches that are out there, people reuse and, and leverage the same passwords. Being able to use those consistently across your board are often common ways that we often get in and gain, uh, gain access. And so when you look at, at uh, some of the, the, the basics, uh, most of the time it's an asset that you didn't know uh, was exposed on your external perimeter. A lot of times it's a user clicking on something. And still to this day, uh, some of the main methods that we see most organizations getting breached from are macros. Uh, office documents, someone opens up a document and uh, executes those. Has anybody here been able to get rid of macros across their entire environment yet? No? Okay, just checking. There's always, there's, sometimes there's like one. And I'm always amazed, I'm like, I'm like, how did you do that, right? You know, like how did you get that off there? But uh, it's some of those things that we, we typically see and commonly see. Next slide. And so some of the basics that we see, and, and things that are um, uh, unusually interesting that, that are fairly easy for us to implement, but still become uh, very difficult for us to, to implement in our organizations, uh, for one is PowerShell. Uh, PowerShell exploitation is definitely up when it comes to how we see attackers going after your organization uh, from a Windows perspective. And what's interesting about PowerShell is that uh, does Bob and Sales, so let's just say Bob and Sales, and no offense to, to Bob and Sales, um, does Bob and Sales uh, need a full-fledged programming language at his fingertips? Probably not, right? Bob isn't going to be programming PowerShell anytime soon to get his sales metrics off uh, in his environment. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do to limit and constrain uh, how specific attacks work. And disallowing PowerShell to everybody in your environment except for developers, systems administrators, that's all doable without breaking the functionality of, of Windows itself. And so there's some basic things that we can do in our environments just to minimize our attack surface uh, where most of us don't typically look at. Uh, and those things um, often uh, cause a lot of issues for us when it, when it uh, comes to those. Uh, detection becomes a major issue in a lot of organizations. Uh, is anybody here able to get all of their endpoint logs, like every single one of them, and sending them back to a central location? No? Not one? Endpoint logs, by the way, today are a must. Uh, absolute have to have endpoint logs when it comes to identifying what's happening out there. If your largest attack surface is your user population, which you look at the breach statistics, users end up being your largest breach statistic. Um, endpoint logs are an absolute must when it comes to identifying specific threats in your environment. Uh, that's where all of the attacks are typically happening. Uh, next slide. 
And so if you look at most organizations, they're still at a basic cybersecurity level. And when I say basic cybersecurity level, you're still developing a lot of your programs, uh, from vulnerability management to software security, uh, application security. And application security is an interesting one because you know, if you look at what we try to focus on, uh, it, it's, I love the evolution of security. Like we try to go to like this castle mentality where we have these archers and heavily fortified walls and we have firewalls that, that, that compartmentalize everything and then we're like, hey, we need to move to the cloud. Like, well, there goes the castle, right? Now we have like these tent cities that you can walk through and kind of see everything that's going on in your environment. Um, and same thing for application security. Now we have DevOps, right? And more agile workflows where getting a hold of that's an interesting dilemma where you have software that's being pushed all the time in a, you know, an extension of your entire team directly into production and getting a hold of, of understanding software defects in that type of environment becomes really, really challenging. And so you know, we have all these different concerns that we have to deal with, so a lot of companies are still at a very basic level and not understanding really a lot of the threats that are happening out there today. So hopefully we can clarify some of those as we go along. Next slide. And so if you look at some breach statistics, I wanted to show ways that, that attackers are getting access to your environment. And we looked at over 17,000 compromises uh, or attempted compromises within organizations um, over the past year. And looking at those specific breaches, um, most of them still occur from executables. Uh, so an attacker going and downloading an executable once they actually run something on the system. And why that's important to understand is that that's still pretty much hacking from like the 1990s. Uh, you know, that's, that's still basically going and downloading a, a piece of code from the internet that's untrusted and unsigned in your environment that you still allow uh, to run in your environment because application whitelisting is really hard uh, and, and executes and, and, and um, uh, compromises the system. Now, what's interesting enough is that PowerShell is up from last year. Uh, PowerShell was 8% uh, the, the year before, up 13%. So definitely see it more and more attackers leveraging PowerShell um, as a main conduit or, or avenue of attack. Now, one thing you might not recognize is, is what we call uh, living off the land binaries and scripts. Um, this is an important concept because most folks aren't even close. To, most folks are just getting to understanding and, and looking for PowerShell. Uh, when it comes to the new attack fronts that we see out there today, most folks aren't looking at these. And uh, what this is, is that in Linux, Windows, and OS X, and Mac, uh, you have an operating system, right? And that operating system has to run, and has to run applications, right? You use Office, you use Java, you use Calculator, uh, you use a lot of different programs that make your operating system work. Now, these applications are code signed by the, by the, by the producer of that code. So it's signed by Apple, you know, it's signed by Linux, or whatever uh, Linux distribution you're leveraging. Uh, it's signed by Microsoft. And when those applications get shipped, they have functionality that allow them to work. Uh, and so there's additional um, applications within Windows that ships by default, and Linux that ships by default, and Apple that ships by default, that have these, th these specific types of functionality that allow attackers to do additional things on the system. And what I mean by that is there's a number of them that uh, allow you to essentially, just as an example, go out to the internet, download unsigned code, execute in memory without any type of trace. So, you know, like for example, there's one called regsvr32 in the system32 directory, uh, that can go and download its proxy where it goes in and downloads it goes and downloads code from the internet, executes it on your system. Attacker has access to your system and it's running from a trusted Microsoft application. So from your application whitelisting st standpoint for doing those, allows you to actively go and run those. And so this is a whole area of research right now that's happening. There's about 77 or so publicly known living off the land binaries and scripts uh, for a number of different uh, operating systems out there uh, that attackers are leveraging for code execution. Uh, uh, ransomware campaigns like Locky, a number of other ones that we've seen out there before, um, leverage those types of, of ways. Uh, there was one called Kofter a while ago um, that used what we call fileless persistence method, so it never actually wrote anything to disk. It would use registry entries to then call a living off the land binaries and scripts and then execute code on the system. So there's a lot of different things that, uh, 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 a lot of research that's going into this area right now, and specifically for attackers to gain access to your system that way. Um, so that, th that's another area of concern that most companies aren't even looking for. Um, if you're interested in understanding more about those, one of our folks at Trusted Tech, uh, Advar Mo, uh, runs the, the Living Off the Land Binaries and Scripts project. So if you look up L uh, Lawbass project, uh, you can see those specific ones um, out there. Talking about some breakout timeframes, uh, one thing that's important to note is, is the time that we have to respond to incidents uh, is becoming less and less and less. And what I mean by that is we, we analyzed a number of different breaches from last year, and on average is about an hour and a half, a little bit, a little over an hour and a half to when a system became compromised to when that attacker moved to a different system. And what that's important to understand is, is what we call post-exploitation and lateral movement. When we compromise Bob and sales, 
Bob and Sales isn't our, our end goal of what we want to accomplish in that environment. We want access to sensitive data. We want access to intellectual property. We want access to specific things about your business uh, or areas that I can make money off of or ransomware campaigns and, and, and encrypting syst uh, systems and, and holding them for ransom. And so once they do that, you have to get information off of that system in, in order to move to other systems in the network, whether that's a password in memory, whether that's another um, uh, area that we can move from one system to the next. And on average, it's about an hour and a half. So as responders, you know, we probably don't care that Bob and Sales gets compromised because Bob and Sales in the grand scheme of things isn't going to be the downfall of our entire company. But when they start moving to other systems and they start getting access to other systems, uh, that's when we start to have a problem. And that's when we start to have a much larger breach in our hands. And so if you look at some of these different areas, lateral movement and moving to different systems, we have about an hour and a half to respond to those specific threats. So detecting it, preventing it, you know, containing it, removing it from the system, um, all those things become really, really important to stop a lot of these data breaches. If you look at some breach statistics, most organizations don't notice a breach until it's happened over six months. So that's a, it's a pretty interesting uh, uh, statistic. For six months, a breach goes unnoticed. Now, if you look at the Starwood Hotel breach, it was several years uh, before they noticed those specific incidents, and it just happened to find it on an assessment. They were doing a penetration test, and they're like, oh, this isn't normal. There's already an encrypted volume here, and they investigated, and it was China for you know, several years ago. Um, so these types of things a lot of times go unnoticed, which cause a lot of different issues. So with that, um, I'll kick it off back to Alex, and uh, we'll get started on the panel piece. Thank you very much, Dave. So jumping right into it, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Todd Kaltenborn, who is the SOC manager at Binary Defense. And let me ask you, Todd, from your experience with working with uh, a number of clients at Binary, why do you think companies are failing at detecting attacks, and what can be done to improve detection capabilities? Thanks, Alex. Um, can everyone hear me? I have some thoughts. Um, and it's not unique to my time at Binary Defense. Um, Across the industry, um, it's always come back to three things. A lack of people, a lack of time, and a lack of skill. It's always a combination or a, a single thing of those. So organizations come in, we've all seen it, we've all been in IT or security in some aspect, and you have one person or two people or a team of people, and they're like, oh, I know you're doing IT and you're managing all these systems, but oh, by the way, you also have to take on security. An example that comes to mind of a client we were engaging with and they had this huge Splunk environment. And oh, by the way, we're talking to their single, single security person for their entire, uh, probably three, 4,000 endpoints. And we ask, okay, take us through kind of your day to day. What do you do in Splunk? Show us your alarm, show us dashboards. And I don't know if I actually, it was actually said or I just kind of heard it in my brain, but I heard, um, oh, oh, bless your heart. <laughs> there isn't enough time for me to spend in here day to day what I do is I create some queries, they run at midnight, and they email me the alerts, and I look at them the next day when I come in to work. And then Dave and I were on the phone, and there was a kind of a pause on our end, and we looked at each other and went, okay. And I was still rather um, speechless, and, and Dave asked, okay, well, how's that working for you? And without skipping a beat, you know, well, I think it's working great, and, um, you know, we haven't been breached yet that I'm aware of. And, um, you know, everything's going great. <clears throat> Kick it off a few weeks later, we've engaged with the clients. And by the way, they had six compromised systems right off the bat. And a slew of, of phishing expeditions had some, some rooted accounts. Um, and we went in, identified those things right away. And that was within probably weeks uh, of the engagement. So most organizations, and it's not their fault, but they purchased the latest shiny new tool, right? Typically, it happens after Black Hat DEF CON is when we see an increase in this. But someone still has to look at it. Someone still has to manage it. And all those people have to have the training and talent to be able to do so. No security product is a set it and forget it type of scenario. If it was, none of us would be sitting here. We'd all be finding something else to do. We'd all have different careers, right? So that, those are the reasons right there, those three reasons. And all of us have been in the industry long enough to know that, that both tri uh, binary defense and trusted sec were created, right? To make the world a safer place, I think is what you said in the beginning. Um, but these have been endemic to our industry forever. So what do you do about it? Well, it, as Dave mentioned, it's a back to basics approach, but we've been saying that since the 90s. And we, just, as an industry, we haven't caught on. Um, and one of the things I didn't know was unique to the private sector coming from the military is uh, you need to learn and know your environment. 
right, as our industry as a whole is trying to shift that lens of attack, uh, or detection rather, to the left, right? We want to detect attacks earlier. But as the sophistication of the attacks change and increase, and you have people at Trusted Sec with their talents trying to figure out ways to kind of come in under the radar and bypass all those, it's going to become increasingly difficult to identify what's abnormal if we have no idea what normal looks like. Um, and more often than not, clients don't have an idea of what's going on in their environment. So then they, they bring us in, and what we do is our team of engineers and experts come in, identify critical log sources, get those feeding to the sim, start identifying their use cases and working with them to create those use cases and alarms and get those in place. A lot of times, though, we won't see what's going on in the environment until after the tools are already in place. Um, an example of this comes to mind. Uh, we had a client with Vision installed. Everything was going great. Two days into deployment, all the assets are, are engaged, and they email us and say, hey, um, you know, can, can we get on a call real quick? We're having some problems keeping up with what, what you're sending us. And we say, okay. So we ended on the call, and they said, hey, Vision's great. It's really detailed, um, but can you stop sending us historical data? And we were confused, so there's a, you know, we paused for a second, we said, what do, what do you mean, historical data? And they said, well, you keep sending us information about this user that keeps moving laterally through our environment. Um, that user hasn't been employed here for six months. We muted and, and sat there for a second and went, okay, how, how do you respond? Um, so unmute, we don't send historical data. Um, that's not how the tool works. You know, we're sending, this is going on in your environment right now. Um, there was some back and forth because there was some disbelief there and finally we convinced them like, no, this is, I'm watching it happen. So the user might not be there, but this account is, is moving laterally through your environment and by the way has touched every asset that you have a vision deployed on. Um, so it goes back to kind of a kickback and call back to the six month time frame. I believe also there was a slide up there that mentioned um, small, small and medium sized businesses uh, fold, right? within six months, I think it was 60% of small and medium businesses fold within six months of a cyber attack. So that six month time frame keeps, keeps kind of reoccurring. Um, the other thing we need to do besides knowing our environment is testing, like regular assessments. Penetration tests are great, right? They, you have the controls in place, right? So the engineers have identified critical log sources. You've got those feeding into the SIM. SIM, all the other tools are in place and we're monitoring. And now we need to make sure and test those controls are in place. Um, and I think that's becoming more apparent in our industry and more, more um, prevalent. Purple team engagements are also helpful. Um, you, know, you want people, the only issue I've ever had with penetration tests is timing of getting the report back, and that's not on uh, like the organization performing the test, but by the time it trickles down to the people that actually can enforce and make change, the data sometimes is gone due to retention um, constraints and things like that. So um, purple team activities, that, you know, everybody's in the same room, attack is happening, okay, I identify the stuff, put the detection rules in place, and we move on. I think those things, uh, and going back to basics, are going to kind of continue to be the issues and, and the solutions. This is a lot of great information. It, it's funny, whenever you mentioned the tools, and I always like to use the treadmill example, and you know, if I go and buy the best treadmill in the world and put it in front of my TV, am I in shape? Well, no, right? I have to use it as part of a program and, and other elements. So two quick things, um, uh, Todd. Quick, uh, Alex, uh, real quick on that one, too. Um, interesting enough, I was on a call yesterday. Test, test. Okay. I was on a call yesterday, and um, uh, it was, it was, I do a, a thing uh, with an organization called IANS, which I think there's a, a few folks here, and there's a, a piece called Ask an Expert, which they kind of ask a, you know, some questions around there. And I had a, a, a person, an individual, that had to have an urgent Ask an Expert. Apparently, I'm an expert. That's it's weird. Um, and so you know, they're like, "Hey, um, our CIO uh, was under the impression that Fire it was this is, at the time was FireEye. FireEye has no impact to performance or system. Um, and so we deployed it to our entire environment. And it's been this year-long program where we've been rolling out FireEye. And one of our servers um, had a, a major issue where the CPU spiked. So he wants to remove the whole thing. I'm like, okay, did you talk to support about like trying to get that, that CPU issue down or maybe that one CPU's having, or that one computer's having issues? You're like, no, our CEO, our CIO just wants to rip it out and go with something different. I'm like, okay. So I'm like, you made a, you made a year long investment in, in something and you had one server out of your entire environment that had an issue and you want to rip out a, a piece of technology. And he's like, yes. I'm like, okay. I'm like, so what do you want to go with? And he's like, well, we only have two people dedicated to security, which is why it's taken us a year to, to roll this out. Um, and they're like, hey, we have their, their 
uh, male adapters, you know, the, 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 for, their, uh, for the male, the, the NX, they have the HX or the endpoints. They're like, hey, we want to move to this company. I'm like, okay, well, you can go to that, but you're only going to get the endpoints. And you can go to that, but you're still going to have to go to another technology to do the mail and everything else. They're like, yeah, we're looking at buying about seven to eight technologies to fill the same thing that we have over here. And I'm like, so you have two people dedicated security, and you're buying seven to eight additional tools on your current workload to handle those. I'm like, you really need to find a new job. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, I wouldn't want to be there. Um, and so I really uh, focused on trying to paint the picture of like, listen, you already made this investment. Why don't you try to figure out what the issue was? And you know, a lot of times we'll go into in environments, and it's a completely undersized environment where they have like old legacy systems. They're like, hey, we need this to run on Windows NT. You're like, listen, I'm sorry, like we're not going to have it run on Windows NT. Like you, you need to work on removing this, or you know, isolating it, or moving it to its own network segment, or whatever you need to do for for the organization. But a lot of times, buying new pieces of technology um, isn't what you need. A lot of times, it's using and leveraging the same types of resources that you have, just using them more efficiently. And, and time and time again, when we go into companies, you, know, you look at their vulnerability management program as a great example. You go into a company and you look at their vulnerability management program, they want to fix all the findings. Right? So you have 10 million findings, and you want to fix them all. And the IT folks are like, hey, you, you know, God forbid you, you have one false positive uh, in that report that you send them. Uh, but you know, they're sitting there and they're trying to fix, you know, let's just say, 100 findings a month to address specific issues in your environment when you're not fixing the root cause of why those were there in the first place, your patch management process, the way that you have configuration management in your environment for baselines, fixing the root cause first, and then from there trying to address it afterwards. So it's easier for us to go and say, hey, here's a report of 10 million findings, go and fix this, than it is for us to actually address the problem around patch management. And that's the, the big difference is getting to a lot of the root cause areas that we see out there, addressing your programs first, and then kind of working on from there. Thank you very much. And, and so one other thing, I know, uh, uh, Todd, you mentioned vision. So if you could just give a, uh, not everyone in the room knows what that is, uh, just talk about that for a, a couple seconds. And then also if you could just address threat intelligence a bit and kind of what we're doing in that area. Vision's our managed detection and response tool. Um, very lightweight agent. agent. Uh, we deploy it out, and we can be up and monitoring within like minutes, literally. Um, I think the quickest deployment we had was uh, maybe two, three hundred endpoints, and we were up and active and and throwing alarms and tickets with remediation recommendations to the client within uh, a few hours of ki the kickoff call. Um, Perfect. Thank you very much. Perfect. That'll be. Yeah. Got to turn it on first. Um, when it when it comes to understanding uh, threat intelligence, I think that's a, an important piece. Uh, there's a lot of things happening out there, and I think most organizations struggle with with keeping up to date. Uh, one thing I see in a lot of companies talking about the basics is that you have all of these different things that you're doing. Does anybody here not have to deal with day to day meetings? By the way. You know, you might have a specific technology, right, in, in place that you're, you're in charge of or managing or a specific program. Do you, if you could just actually focus on that product all day long, what would happen? Wouldn't it be amazing? Like you had no distractions. You actually do work, right? I love using the analogy of, of uh, uh, when, when Spectre and Meltdown came out. Um, anybody remember Spectre and Meltdown, right? Everybody was freaking out, right? Anybody here not have a freak out moment? You didn't have a freak out moment? Because you probably looked at what it actually was, right? So Spectre Meltdown, what was an interesting piece about that is, is the world was burning, right? We're going to have all these major issues and catastrophic problems. And so everybody's like, we need to patch right now. So like BIOS patching in your environment with a, a 20 to 30% reduction in performance, probably not the easiest thing to do in an organization, right? So big impact, big, idea, uh, big deal. Now, if you look at the actual vulnerability itself, it's really interesting how you'd have to exploit it. You would have to have your servers, for example, going to some really shady sites that are running exploit code in order to exfil some of your data. So hopefully you don't have your servers and you don't have domain admins on your servers browsing shady sites in your environment. That's usually not a good idea. Um, to, to have an impact in that specific area. Now your workstation environment's a little bit different, right? You might possibly go to the systems and whatnot. The exploitability of it though was really low. Now I'd ask a question, can anybody here implement a change in their environment the, the, the day an attack comes out. Can you make a sweeping patch across your environment the day it comes out, anybody? Most folks can't, right? Let alone new attack vectors that come out every day. Does anybody here have dedicated time for research? At least 20 to 30% of your job is research time dedicated to new attack vectors that are coming out, uh, out there. Probably not. 
right? Last week, there was a new living off the land binaries and scripts that was introduced. Uh, and there's a, there was a, a, a technique through um, Microsoft Teams that allowed you to get remote code execution uh, onto systems. Are you keeping up with those types of things? The answer is probably not. And that's where things like threat intelligence come into play. Understanding specific attacks that are very specific towards your organization or your environment that allow you to gain more insight that doesn't require you having to do the research. Now here's the problem. Threat intelligence, as, as, as a, a rule of thumb, has really just become an ingestion into your environment for IP addresses, hashes, things like that. And while those can be valuable for things that have already been seen, and a lot of times it's very difficult for an organization to look at what's actually relevant to them and being able to address them. Understanding what your adversaries are doing, understanding people that have direct threats towards you and your industry vertical and your, uh, within your organizations to be able to really combat those and, and focus on those. Um, and that's one of the, the main pieces on threat intelligence. Dave? All right, so. Absolutely. So, uh, so moving, I'd like to introduce uh, Dave to Simon, who's our uh, Chief Security Officer over at Binary. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, I've seen a lot of presentations lately, um, you know, about threat intelligence. And I think it's one of those things that it's a term that's oftentimes used uh, to mean different things. But, you know, it, as far as it goes, could you tell me kind of uh, how you define it, the high-level overview, how you implement it, you know, what kind of activities are involved? Yeah, that's fine. So just a kind of a show of hands, as Dave likes to do, um, how many people here actually do threat intelligence or has it within their organization? Okay. So what, what we see a, a lot of times working with uh, clients is that it's not always understood what exactly threat intelligence is, as, as Dave was saying. What, what is it? Why is it needed? Um, whenever we go through a sales cycle or we're discussing it with people, we discuss threat intelligence, and it always comes down to, that sounds great, that sounds wonderful, but what are your IP addresses? Give me your ban list, give me your hashes. But threat intelligence, there's so much more to it that I don't think people understand, and it can be so much more valuable to organizations, but it's such a limited scope of understanding from either a company level or, or an industry level that it's, it's difficult to have them understand the, the true benefit of what threat intelligence, good threat intelligence is for an organization. Another piece that Dave hit on is that um, we, we push too much onto our internal security teams. So it's very difficult for an internal security team to do good threat intelligence. Um, previous place that I worked at and, and others, you have, I would have a, a SIM. SIMs are very large, very complex. We would dedicate a person to that SIM. And then there'd be another product that would come out. Okay, now your SIM and now your M, uh, uh, mobile device management. Okay, now we have to do threat intelligence. Now you're this guy and this guy and this, this girl. You have to focus on all of these things. And I think it's giving organizations a false sense of security to say, yep, I am the threat intelligence person. And all they're really doing is looking at some security sites and following some people on Twitter, which they're gonna get days old information because they cannot spend their time really focusing on the information of what they actually need to do. So they end up following people on Twitter, seeing what's going on, and then they just see a picture of a person's broken foot because they fell out of a trash can. So, um, so it's just, it's finding right information and where to go for the information is absolutely key for, for threat intelligence. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so kind of how we started doing threat intelligence and just kind of like a lessons learned. So um, we hired a few former military intelligence personnel for our security operations center. Um, during their off hours, they would perform threat intelligence um, just to kind of keep up to date on it, see what is out there. And they realized that they were finding amazing amounts of information all over the place that were pertaining to our clients. So whether that was leaked credentials or newly released malware or um, you know, up and coming attack campaigns, our clients never knew any of this was actually happening. In the past, what we used to do, and at times still today, is that we will actually reach out to other companies to say there is an impending attack that's actually occurring. And all of that information would not have been able to be found if they weren't looking, specifically looking for that information that is out there, getting the contacts, going to the forums, hitting places of the internet that most people aren't actually going. Um, without doing that, without doing good threat intelligence and dedicating your time to do so, um, you're unfortunately not going to, be do it, you're going to be able to do it very successfully. And that's kind of the problem, it goes back to the false sense of security. Um, kind of what Dave was talking about a little bit, um, the way we perform threat intel is not only rely on automated tools, but actually use humans to interpret and understand the data that we are gathering and ingesting. So a tool or an app, it cannot create a shadow account. It cannot maintain relationships with bad people. 
um, which is where at times you're gonna find the most useful information. So many times we've been able to get inside of groups and pose as different individuals and really understand what are they doing or what are they trading, buying and selling. And that has become very valuable for, for us within our applications, within SIM, within Vision, to be able to put that in there. Um, the, the, if, I, if we always waited for data that was just posted publicly, we would always be behind. So being able to really hit it as soon as it's being published, as soon as people are talking about it and trading it, has been very good for us. Automated tools can be good. I think there is value there, but they also have a very high false positive ratio. Um, and in doing so, it goes back to having that person dedicated to taking a look at the data that's being there and actually being able to understand it and interpret it. You can only do so much with keywords. You can only do you know, binary defense and attack and so on and so forth, but you have to understand what exactly are you looking for and what is important to your business. So not all clients are the same. That goes with any piece of our businesses here. Not all clients are the same. So what is important to you, what is a threat to you, you have to understand that and you have to know that and you have to define that so then you can actually understand how to protect yourself and what to look, look for and what to then make sure that you are protecting yourself um, against. So from things that we've seen, um, earlier on we uh, uncovered a large scale um, uh, planned attack against a bank. So what happened there was, uh, this was I believe during the Occupy uh, whatever movement at that time, and uh, we were able to gain access to a group. And these groups are interesting because you have to prove yourself and you have to be vetted. Um, so the individuals were able to do that, make their way all the way through, and then listen in and read about the planned attacks that they were gonna be um, going forward with the, the banks. So we went through the list and we notified um, a few of our clients that they were going to be targeted with this. They were able to um, protect themselves and uh, obviously not be Im impacted by this. So we found leaked credentials, proprietary information. We found zero day threats and really everything in, be in between. Uh, some of our clients will do things where they code something into their application. Um, then we will put it into our application, into our searching tool, if you will, or a scraper. And then if that piece of code gets leaked or gets put on one of the gets, we're able to, then to take a look at it and understand what is actually going on and report back to that client that it may not be malicious, but someone made a mistake and now you have proprietary information that is, that is out there. Um, we've had instances where people will post on Twitter, as, as basic as it sounds, that we, I just got a job at this store and then the next couple of posts later are, I, they show information of them stealing from the store. Or I just got a job at whatever company and then the previous post before was drug usage or other sort of illegal activities. These things, most people won't think that as true threat intelligence, but that's still a brand image that companies are gonna wanna know about because when someone looks you up and someone does a search about you, that is what they're going to be seeing about you. So it's very important. Threat intelligence at times is not just the information security group, it's the risk group, it's the HR group. There's many different groups that threat intelligence can be very beneficial for. And again, I, it goes back to the fact of, I don't know if it's always truly understood what it can actually do. Um, a long time ago, uh, I'll say that, um, I worked for an organization that we found something malicious that was inside. So our SIM detected us and they said, you know, it, it pop, popped it up and said, someone's logging in, um, talk to the person, that person said I did not log, log in. So that was a big, big problem. Um, we took the offending IP address, we did what every security person up here has ever done, and we Googled it, and it came back as everything was, was fine, no hits whatsoever. Contacted law enforcement, um, and everything came back fine also. So if I would have stopped there, I, everything would have been a-okay, I would have handled the incident. Um, there were a few uh, people within the industry that were working on threat intelligence that I had uh, con contacts with, and I posted to a listserv, and I said, you know, I just saw, saw this, I'm getting no hits whatsoever, does anyone have any sort of information? And I received an email back saying, basically, let's not talk through email, please give me, a, give me a call. So obviously I knew it was probably really good information. So I contacted them, and they said, basically, this thing that's in your environment, or what you're seeing, is extremely bad, but no one else knew this and no one else saw this. But based on the information that they gathered, this threat information that was so very important, were able to show us that it was a APT group out of China. And it was basically spent the next three months of my life working on doing just that and working on, on the incident. We would have handled the incident, 
but we would have known it was just the tip of the iceberg that was actually affecting us. So, I mean, in my opinion, it's for everyone here, it's really understand threat intelligence, dedicate people to it, reach out to companies that do it, truly understand what exactly it can do for your organization and how it can help you. I think it would put everyone at a much better spot. So, well, how about, how about internally as well? So do you feel like organizations know their environments really well and know what to look for and have a good baseline and things like that? A lot of times not. So I think organizations know themselves, but I think a lot of times organizations, they, they sometimes IT and security falls into this thing of saying this is what, this is my box and this is what it is, and they fail to understand what, their, what is truly important to their organization. So I understand I'm in security that this is important to me, it's a vulnerability, this is important, this is, you know, I sell whatever. But when you work with the, it's, it's very important to have those business contacts and work with those individuals to understand from their perspective. Whenever I work for an organization, I always make it a point to talk to very specific people within the business, business leaders to understand what is the business, what's important to them, and if we lost this thing, how bad would it be for us? So if my business is e-commerce and the e-commerce goes, goes down, what is going to happen to us, our jobs, uh, and so on and so forth? So I think, I, I don't think we do a very good job of understanding the business completely, but I think it is absolutely necessary to fully understand what, uh, how to protect it. One thing I'll say too is I think uh, we get in a cycle of, of normal ways of, of handling situations and behavior. And this goes into, the, I think, what Tyler can talk about a little bit on the, the threat hunting piece. When, you, when we see a, a, an alarm, our immediate reaction is to reduce that pain, right? To either look at that alarm to see whether or not it's malicious, whether it's a false positive, and to move on or to address it. But what if there's something in there that wasn't programmed, a, a correlation that wasn't written or wasn't firing properly or changed your logs in some way, shape, or form? And, and let's just say Bob in sales is now logging into Mary and IT's computer for the very first time. That's a behavior, right? That's something that is unusual in your environment that you should be looking for, but most folks are looking for, hey, someone's trying to run this exploit on this specific system. And so I think as an industry, we are shifting more towards understanding usual behavior in your environment and trying to look for deviations of those. Um, a funny story, uh, one of our folks, um, Jason Lang, is on, 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 our, on a red team, was doing a red team engagement. And red teams are, are uh, basically we build threat models off of organizations and we target them very similarly to what their threats are. So whether it's a nation state or commoditized malware or you know, organized crime, you know, basically where their industry vertical is at, focusing on more tailored attacks against their organization, customized tooling, you know, uh, things like that. They're more for more mature organizations, I think, that have already good visibility and monitoring and trying to enhance their, their capabilities. And uh, Jason was doing a red team engagement and uh, he spent like three months building out this profile and this new attack. He was really excited to use it on this customer, right? It's, uh, it was new uh, command and control infrastructure. Our research team was working on it and uh, used a bunch of undocumented ways of, of, of getting access into environment. Uh, basically desealization techniques that haven't been discovered uh, yet in Microsoft. And so, um, and so we, we get code execution onto this machine and we were really excited about it because it was like this is the first time we'd spent all this time working on this. And literally about four minutes later, uh, they, they moved the machine in containment and, and moved the machine off of the network. They're like, we're like, how the heck did you detect us? Like we basically used like everything that has never been discovered before to get access to your machine. And they're like, well, we actually profiled all of our users based on position, HR, sales, IT, and we look for technical commands on non-technical people. And so Jason had typed in IP config. And they triggered an alarm on IP config. Why is this person in marketing running an IP config? And that busted us when it came to all of this research and work and using undocumented features and zero day type type stuff because we typed freaking IP config. And, and obviously we're all really upset, you know, we're, we're pretty much uh, crying to like some careless whispers in a chat room, but uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, it, those types of things of unusual behavior make a huge difference. I'd rather have a false positive when, you know, Bob in, in HR types IP config. Like, hey Bob, do you want IP config? Yeah, actually, yeah, I do, I do. Okay, well I can baseline that from the, Bob actually knows what IP config is to look at an IP address to, to do certain things in the future, okay? Um, but those types of deviations of behavior become really important within industries. And uh, there's a, a, a thing that you were on recently that I remember um, that, that I, just, I just found very f interesting and kind of, kind of funny. It was a threat hunting exercise, and you can explain it way better than me. But literally within a few minutes of you being there, 
you know, found a number of different uh, breaches, and they'd already gone through, an, I mean, they had a full-fledged infrastructure, security operations center, people monitoring 24-7. I mean, they brought us in to look at a breach. I don't know if you want to talk about that one. Yeah, so um, what, what Dave's talking about, if you're not familiar with what threat hunting is, threat hunting is essentially just proactive searching for attackers. You know, there's been a shift in the, um, there, there's been a shift in the, uh, uh, the, the thinking of a lot of organizations to, from, you know, trying to prevent an attack to assuming you've already been compromised and then going out and proactively searching for those attackers within your network. And so we get called in to do some threat hunting uh, exercises. And uh, basically we come in and we look at your infrastructure, we, we look at you know, your visibility, we look at your hosts, uh, we look at your, your network and see if we see any attackers, essentially what it comes down to. In this particular engagement, it wasn't even a, a true threat hunting, it was a proof of concept where they gave us access to their SIM and you know, we. With a proof of concept, you know, we're not going to do the whole thing. We, we came in and we started looking uh, on their SIM. They, they actually had some pretty good visibility. They were logging things, uh, Dave mentioned, you know, endpoint visibility, you know, logging uh, things uh, on your endpoints. They were actually doing that. They were, they were logging um, PowerShell. They were logging their commands. Get on there, get in their SIM, and within five minutes, I found, I think, 40 systems that had been compromised. And the way that I found that was just looking for encoded PowerShell commands. Uh, just the PowerShell dash E and then some base 64 string. Uh, within like five minutes found, you know, 40 systems that have been compromised that they hadn't found because they weren't looking for that particular thing. And this is really what threat hunting boils down to is, you know, looking at uh, what the attackers are going to do, you know, it ties directly back into threat intelligence uh, and, you know, the law bins and, and, and everything like that. Understanding how the attackers are going to, to do what they do, make sure you can see that and then start searching your environment for it. And you are going to get false positives for this. Uh, inevitably, you have some admin who's being clever and uh, doing some encoded PowerShell command or, or running something that where, you know, it looks malicious, but you're still going to um, find the, that bad stuff that's in your environment and you'll, you'll start to find, excuse me, when you start to do this, that the, uh, the, 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 um, the time of compromise that the, uh, the attackers have on your network, the, the, the time that they're sitting on your network, uh, tends to uh, shrink and you'll start detecting them faster and, and you'll start kicking them out of your network faster. Really quick, so um, speaking about the false positives, so it's always good also to, when you're doing threat hunting to, if you see something that looks odd to make sure that you're actually testing it and looking at it to make sure they are a true false positive. Um, we had a client that <laughs> the SOC detected via threat hunting WannaCry. So we saw we're like, there's, there's no way. Like this, this probably is not a real thing. This is recent, by the way. This is like, <laughs> like two weeks ago. <laughs> two weeks ago. <laughs> we saw WannaCry. So, so I was like, no, like this is probably not a real thing. So the one analyst escalated up and he's just like, ah, what do you think? He's like, you know, I'm, this, is, this can't be right. He's probably wrong. So we're like, oh, just reach, reach out to them, let them know, just to cover ourselves, just to make sure. So they responded back and they came back and they said, um, yep, it is. And, and basically if it's, they knew about it, they understood it. It was one of those things where they just, they've, their environment is so large and so complex. They have just basically saying, we are just going to leave them alone. So you can stop reporting it because it is what it is. So from our standpoint, we're like, oh my gosh, like I can't believe that they're just gonna leave this alone. And as they even said, if, there's not, if it's not calling out to the internet, we don't even care about it. But if we didn't take those, if, if we looked at it and we thought, no, this is probably a false positive because there's no way this is something that's actually still real within people's environments, we would have probably skipped over that. So it's very important to, no matter what it looks like, to always still report it and also take an actual look at it. Dave, is, is there any kind of routine testing that can make sure your threat hunting is working properly? One thing, one thing I'll hit on real quick before we, we hit on that one real, real fast. Uh, we have a, a, a stock analyst, James, that, that focuses on, on his shift on, on threat hunting. So part of uh, how we're broken out is we have stock analysts that are continuously looking for threats at a given time for, for our customers. One thing that I thought was really interesting with, with James is uh, it, was, it was last week or the week before. Uh, he, was, he was like, hey, I'm noticing some unusual lateral movement, and there's been a couple interesting command lines that are being run. So he escalated up to the customer. And the customer's like, Awesome, you you know you, you made your money for this week. Uh, it was a pen test that we had going on. Um, but what's interesting about how that works, and I think threat hunting to me was always kind of the missing link in security. Um, I really feel like it was because you know SOC analysts, it's it's very tough for SOC analysts. SOC analysts have a lot of mental fatigue because you're literally going through alarms day in and day out, and 90% of those alarms are false positives. But when you actually get a real one making sure that the analyst can say, hey, this is a real one, and to raise that alarm and exception is something that you have to train folks to do. And with threat hunting, what I really like about it 
is it's a way for you to be more proactive. Looking through your, like doing command line auditing. You can use a group policy setting to send an, uh, uh, an event that has all of your command lines that are being run in your environment. That's a huge benefit. Attackers leverage command lines all the time. A good example is, why would a regular user ever try to enumerate domain groups from the command line using the net user command, right? That's a great way of just looking for and enumerating specific p uh, pieces of, of things in your systems. But you might have a technical person in your environment that needs to do that. So again, it's, it's being more proactive and understanding how attackers think, leveraging PowerShell, new services that are being created, um, leveraging DNS uh, as, a, as a method. You, there, you can do time-based analysis on DNS to say, okay, you know, based on the DNS queries, they're, they're in sequential in times. It's probably a beacon or a command and control server beaconing out to the internet um, over specific time intervals or leveraging things like Jitter to, to find, find uh, variations of those. So for me, threat hunting was always kind of that missing link. And I talk about what we're kind of missing in security, people that understand how attacks work in your environment and being able to look for those that are outside the realm of traditional alarms. And that's, that's really what, as an industry, we have to focus on baselining your behavior of your environment, deviations. Why is Bob now communicating to a Ukrainian site you know, that, that is now offering malware out? You know, those are things that we can identify based on behavior, but maybe it hasn't been updated yet in your antivirus signature. Maybe it hasn't been updated yet in your tool. You know, maybe attackers are using a new obfuscated way of, of getting access to your environment. I think all of those are, are key things. And to Alex's question, there's, there's a good sense of, of, of where we feel in security. Right? We feel like we're never perfect, right? Uh, we feel like we always have a lot of things to do. Uh, but not having a, a understanding around where our deviations or our gaps are in our programs are, I think, become important. Good question. A uh, question just to, to emphasize is antivirus still, still necessary? Um, antivirus for us as attackers is extremely trivial to circumvent and bypass. And, and, and it doesn't matter if it's Windows Defender, if it's McAfee or Symantec or whomever, the product doesn't make a difference. Antivirus technology is, is very much an antiquated way of looking at things. However, what I will say though is for things that are commoditized malware, uh, things that have already hit organizations, uh, ransomware campaigns, which rotate all the time, by the way, and change all the time, um, you know, if it hits, the, the, the theory is, hey, hopefully it hits somebody else before it hits us. And, and that, that is, that is a, not a, a good plan when it comes to those, but it's something that still is necessary in my opinion. Um, I still think antivirus provides a level of, of commoditized detection out there but leveraging more on that, that detection piece and being able to respond much more uh, efficiently, I think is, is a, lot, a lot more different. Uh, a good example of, of detection versus prevention, we'll see attacks come out and be weaponized and used in environments very quickly. NotPetya is a great example. If anybody's familiar with NotPetya, um, I think FedEx had uh, $233 million worth of damages within three hours time frame of NotPetya hitting their infrastructure. Um, that was a, a Ukrainian-based malware, um, well, used against the Ukrainian government. Uh, where they uh, essentially hijacked an accounting software, tax software that was used. And in order to, to, to work in Ukraine, you had to have this tax software installed in your environment. And what happened is a bunch of hackers um, hacked into the infrastructure and, and, and uh, hijacked the update mechanism for the software. And they deployed ransomware through the update mechanism to anybody that had the software. And it was automated malware, um, and it was ransom disguised as kind of uh, ransomware, but it was destructive. What it would do is it would install on the system, and most of the time, if you're running some sort of accounting software, it's running on a server, right? And that server would typically have elevated permissions like a domain administrator account or an administrator account. And what this malware would do is it would go on the system, it would pull all the credentials off of that system uh, using a, a technique that would inject into LSAS and, and basically dump clear text passwords out of memory, WDigest, it's a tool called Mimikatz. And it would use those credentials to move to different systems. And it would delay itself so that it would replicate across your environment like wildfire, and then it would start encrypting the file system. And, the, and it would be under the guise of, hey, you have to pay this ransom to get this, this information back. But the ransomware site basically shut down pretty quickly and, and you weren't able to make payments and no one even got keys to decrypt um, those specific areas. So it literally ripped through customers within minutes. Minutes you'd see lateral movement happening. You'd literally see machines getting hit. And when something like that's happening, antivirus isn't going to protect you. There's no signature that is going to identify that. It just rips through like wildfire across your entire environment. And what's interesting about that specific use case 
is we had a customer that got hit. Uh, we had multiple customers got, that got hit with, with NotPetya. And the, the way that NotPetya worked is it would um, import uh, a file called perfc.dat using run DLL32, uh, which run DLL32 is a very common attack method to get a DLL to run um, on a system uh, for code execution. And it was interesting as we saw that run DLL32 hit immediately, and we contained that system. We moved that machine off of the network so that it couldn't replicate, and then we built a rule pretty much instantaneously that automatically moved machines in containment that had that rule uh, across our environment. So you know, we were able to at least contain a large percentage of that as it was happening in real time, and antivirus wasn't, wasn't doing anything at that, that period. So detection is really important because you look at, at that time to understand new attacks that come out, you can get a detection rule in very quickly to implement prevention on a specific attack. It takes a substantial amount of time, testing, making sure it doesn't impact your environment. You know, uh, I, I really uh, do believe that, that as an industry, we need to focus more and more on detecting things faster than we do at locking and, and, and trying to, to move machines down. Now, there are a lot of great, uh, 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 good, good practices, things like um, application control or application whitelisting. Huge advocate of that. I think application whitelisting is probably one of my biggest investments that I would do as an organization. A good example of application whitelisting um, is if you, look, if you looked at those breach statistics before, what, 83% of all breaches occurred from an executable? Uh, I would say around 80% of those were executables that were run in a user's profile directory. So a user account op you know, opened up an Excel document that had macros that called PowerShell that downloaded an executable and ran in a user profile directory. Time and time again, I see it all the time. So why not block, you know, and you can do this in, in group policy. There's, there's uh, you, if you're leveraging uh, more legacy systems, you can use software restriction policies, you can use app locker, you can use device guard, that's all built into Windows. Um, you can uh, remove, uh, uh, disallow regular users from the ability to run executables that are non-code signed in your user profile directories. Just say, hey, I'm not gonna allow in user folder, I'm not gonna allow non-code signed applications, th things that haven't been signed by a manufacturer to run in our environment. That literally eliminates 80% of your noise out there today, like just by that one sweeping change. Now, again, you want to test that out because maybe you have applications, but you can make exceptions. Hey, it's in this specific directory. We're going to allow it to run um, in this user profile directory because we know this is an exception here. But that thing alone stops 80% of the things that we're seeing out there today. So that prevention is solid, right? That eliminates 80% of our noise for us to focus on the other 20% that we need to, to start focusing on from a detection standpoint. So there's a balance between that. But to answer your question, I do think it still provides a value because you're hoping that the other person got hit first before that signature is updated, uh, before anything else goes on. And re real quick, antivirus provides a ton of value where it meets compliance requirements. So you can have a technical discussion all day whether it's, whether it's good or bad. But if you, you have to comply with something that says you have to have antivirus, then obviously that it's really good at that. So. <laughs> So, uh, so moving on, um, if we could, oh, there it is. So, so Tyler Hudak uh, was the practice lead for incident response over at Trusted Sec, and you know, people like to joke he's not the person you want to see unless you really need him. When of course you want to see him, it's like an ER doc. You want the best one. Um, but uh, you know, obviously, he also does a lot of work on the on the other end, is helping people understand you know threats and and uh, what incidents look like, and helping you be ready for one in the unfortunate event that you do need him out there to 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 help out. But you know, to, to kind of kick it off, if, if you had to choose one thing for any organization to do to prepare for an incident, what would that be? Uh, thanks. Uh, so th the one thing that I would say that if you don't have, um, you need an incident response plan. Um, it, not you know software, not security software. I mean, you do still need the security software. You need to have visibility into your network and the ability to respond. But if you don't have an incident response plan, you are going to be lost in the woods as soon as that incident starts. Um, you know, incidents are very chaotic. Uh, people panic. I, I have been on incidents where 50% of my job was calming people down. And I'm, I'm talking people from the, 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 the technical person doing the work all the way up to, you know, C-level executives. Uh, to give you an example, a couple years ago I was working, uh, I was uh, on call uh, at the organization that I worked at, and I get a call from my director. Uh, and he's like, we just had a user, uh, to give you a little bit of background, our, our engineering team had just uh, implemented something within their VPN where it would do a GeoIP lookup of somebody logging into the VPN. And then it would kind of compare that to like the next time they logged in, uh, and if the, the geographic locations were too far apart, then it would set off an alert. So in other words, if I logged in from Ohio, and then five minutes later I logged in from uh, you know, England, 
you know, technically there is no way for me to travel that far in, in that amount of time, and so it would set off an alert. And so I get a call from my director. He says, uh, you know, we just had a user who, who logged in from our, our home, home city location, and then an hour later they logged in from China. We, we've been compromised by APT. I'm calling the board of directors. I'm, I'm doing this a se severity one alert. You know, we, we need to, you know, all hands on deck. And, you know, at first I'm, you know, I, just like, you know, others have said, I, I kind of went on mute for a second. Um, and, you know, went on unmute and I said, well, wait a minute, we, you know, what, what research have we done on this? Well, well none. Well, but we need to call the directors. And next five, ten minutes, you know, to you know, cut the story short a little bit, um, you know, was me calming him down and saying, all right, well, hold on. Give me, give me and my team ten minutes to do uh, our research, do, to do what our job is, to figure out, you know, what this IP address is. Long story short, it turns out that the, the, the person had gotten on an airplane uh, f uh, and the, the uh, IP address from China was actually f uh, from the airplane. It was bouncing off a satellite to some, you know, one of the whatever, you know, ISP that the, uh, the airplanes use, and that's what they were logging into the VPN as. So it was a non-issue, but, you know, because he, you know, had started to panic, you know, he basically threw the, the plan out of place and, uh, or, or out the window, and so, you know, things just kind of, you know, went crazy from there. So, you, I mean, you definitely need an incident response plan. Um, there are a couple of things that the incident response plan needs. Uh, first, you need to have definitions of what an incident is, what an event is. Uh, this sounds very basic, but I have been in incidents where people have argued for half an hour, 45 minutes as to what an incident actually is. It, having those definitions in there prior to, to that kind of makes it so that, you know, People can still argue, but then you can just say, hey, look, we have this document, it's been approved, uh, you know, just, you know, this is, you know, we're just going off what this is, let's move on. The, the, the incident response plan should also have things like, you know, the, the types of uh, incidents you have and, and the different categories, and that kind of leads into severity. So when, when you get an incident or when something happens, you can say, is this a category three sever uh, severity? Is this a category two? Is this a category one? Uh, type uh, type incident, and then you can tie SLAs into that, uh, which can be very important for tracking metrics as you move forward. So, you know, if you have, let's say, an SLA for a your highest severity, that you have to respond to it within 10 minutes, and you have to have it contained within one hour, you can start tracking that. You may never be able to meet those uh, times, or you, or at least initially not be able to meet those times, but you can at least uh, keep going and you know watch how you improve as as things uh, move forward. Um, in, in addition to, you know, the different types of definitions, you know, the incident response plan should, you know, kind of define the roles in an incident. You know, who is going to be in charge of the incident? Uh, they're typically referred to as like the incident commander. They're the ones who kind of interface between the technical team and the business team. Because you don't want your business level teams, you don't want your C-level executives walking in and bugging your technical people who are trying to do the investigation. You need to segment them off and let them work. But you still need to have that facilitation of communications going on because the business wants to know what's going on and they, they need to know what's going on because they're the ones who are going to have to make the risk decisions uh, regarding, you know, uh, depending on what, what's going on within the incident. You want to have uh, somebody who's like an incident handler. So they're the person who's kind of in charge of the technical team and they're kind of making sure that the technical team is focusing on the right things. Because in my experience, and, and I've done this as well, if, if you just kind of throw somebody into an incident, uh, they're just going to wander all over the place. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of like a five-year-old. They're going to see something shiny over here. Oh, that's really cool. They're going to start looking at that. And then something else is going to happen. A network alert goes off. They're going to start looking at that. You need to have somebody who's kind of controlling that and say, no, you look at network, you look at this host, you look at memory, and so on, just to kind of you know, keep, that, keep that going. And one of the most important uh, people in an incident uh, that is often missed is you need to have what I call an incident scribe. And this is the person who is basically recording everything that is being done during the incident. That is their sole job. It is boring. It is a horrible job to have, but it is one of the most important things because, like I said, incidents are chaotic. People are, are throwing things out. You're finding things. If nobody is documenting that, a week or two or a month later when you have to go in and write that report or talk to the C-level executives as to what happened, if that scribe wasn't there and recording everything, you have to go based off of memory and you're going to forget things. You're going to forget what time a system was contained. You're going to forget who was doing what at, at a certain time. So that, that is definitely one of the, the most important roles. Um, you know, the incident response plan also should contain things like a flow chart. You know, how, how do things happen? When, when do executives get called? When does legal get brought in? 
you know, when do you consider something contained? When do you consider something remediated? Uh, and communication guidelines. This is really important. Um, not only, you know, communication as to things like call trees, you know, who do you call at 3 a.m. When, when something happens or Friday at 6 p.m.? You know, how, how do you get a hold of the, the head of a department when, once they've left? Um, but things like uh, who is going to talk to the media uh, when, when they call? And they will call eventually. Um, what are you going to do when your uh, communication systems internally are compromised? Uh, that's when you need to move to what's called out-of-band communications. And if you want a really good example of how not to do this, uh, start looking at the Baltimore ransomware uh, incident. The Baltimore is like the, the poster child right now for how not to do things. Um, and, I, and I feel bad for them, but you know, they, they've done, they did so many things wrong. And one of the things that they did wrong was they did not set up out-of-band prior to uh, this incident. And a news article came out that when they finally decided that they wanted to do out-of-band, um, they, they set up some Gmail accounts, and uh, Gmail or Google, you know, saw them, thought that they were spammers or something like that, and then kicked them off, closed all their accounts, because they had not set those up beforehand. So you want to have all this stuff set up and, and um, documented it within your incident response plan. Uh, and, and plans are, are they're living. Um, so, so just, again, a show of hands, how many people in here have a uh, incident response plan? Cool. How many have tested that plan within even the last six months? So about, about half that. You need to test your incident response plan. It's a living document. The best way to test that is a tabletop exercise. And really all a tabletop exercise is, for, for lack of a better term, it's Dungeons and Dragons with IT and, and security. You, you have one person who's sitting there describing how to, uh, what, what's going on in, in, in the incident, and everybody else is kind of you know, saying what they do, and that's how you test your incident response plan. Um, I ran one, I've run a lot of these, but I ran one uh, a couple months ago where um, the, the person who had brought us in was actually upset because, you know, there were all these arguments happening during the tabletop exercise as to who should be doing what, even though it was specified in, in the incident response plan. And, um, you know, the, the person was saying, you know, you should be stopping these. And I, and I responded by saying, yes, you know, I, I, I do stop these. However, this is when you want the arguments to happen. You want it to happen during this, this incident, or this tabletop exercise. You don't want it to, it to happen during an actual incident. And so that's what these things like tabletop exercises bring out. Um, in addition to that, you know, uh, you know t uh, the incident response plans kind of lead to also uh, run books and playbooks, which are a bit more detailed as to how you respond to an incident. I, again, going back to incidents are chaotic. Um, if, if you have, let's say, a, a malware incident, you're going to want to have your analysts or your investigators do steps one, two, three, four, and five in order to, to investigate it or in order to contain the device. This is where the run books and playbooks come in. They, they, they document exactly what to do so that if you have somebody new or you have somebody and it's 4 a.m. or it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just something that they're not even thinking about, they can fall back onto this procedure and go through and, and do everything that, that they need to. Yeah. I slept in my 20 beforehand as well, so. <laughs> <laughs>
And one thing to note about that too is, is the response times for that. Uh, time is everything uh, when it comes to that. You want somebody boots on ground, ready to go um, when an incident's occurring. And uh, you know, a lot of times it's days, if not longer, depending on their availability. And usually it's, it's companies that, that kind of pay to play and you get you know, some, some, some you know, kid off of a college bus you know, coming in to, to do your incident response for you. Um, a lot of times we get brought in in conjunction on behalf of the customer to help assist the third party cyber insurance company with technical resources to be able to provide those services for the people that they engage. So it's like a double whammy um, in a lot of cases that you have to deal with for, for a lot of those. Yep. Perfect, thank, thank you very much. So, we're, we're, we're quick. one story, I, I'm gonna hit one story on, on that, what Tyler said before too. Um, knowing your environment, I think is, is really important as you can hear and, and testing those procedures, I think is really important. We had a, a customer one time, uh, we had just installed Vision on in, in the binary defense front and uh, in at two o'clock in the morning, the SOC got an alarm. And that alarm was a PowerShell command that was executing in memory and going and downloading a, an executable directly from a Chinese-based resource on their exchange server, right? Running as a domain administrator. And so, you know, everybody starts freaking out. And the last thing we want to do is contain an exchange server. Uh, so we call the customer at two o'clock in the morning. And the customer's like, shut all this down now. You know, shut, shut the machine down, shut everything down, emails go dark on this, on this customer, right? And we look at that, I mean, it's, it, it, it is, it's obfuscated code, you know, it's, it's going and downloading an executable directly into memory without touching disk at two o'clock in the morning via scheduled task, you know, domain admin, you know, beaconing out to a, a, a customer in China, or a, a company or a, a randomized web server in China for a, a randomized executable name. Looks bad, right? So. The customer shuts the exchange server down, shuts all their emails off, and they're doing analysis. And this is probably around nine o'clock in the morning. They haven't had emails since two o'clock in the morning or two, two or five or so in the morning. And uh, the, the customer shuts everything down. Well, one of the IT folks gets in and he's like, whoa, whoa this, is, this is legit. This is a company we hired, it's a marketing company that gets us exchange metrics. They're based out of China. And they gave us all the data for it. And it was, it was a legit process using a lot of attacker type, type of techniques. So knowing your environment becomes really important. For me, I would have been smashing that exchange server with a hammer, right? You know, but lo and behold, it's actually a legit process. Now, I would argue to say they should probably change their process a bit, you know, incorporate some code signing, you know, maybe leverage different servers, different locations, not using obfuscated PowerShell code or techniques that attackers would use. Um, you know, those are things that I would typically refer to the company from a best practices perspective. But again, knowing your environment and, and looking for those behaviors is important. I'd rather know that that was there, by the way, than not, right? Now that I know that that behavior is there, I can monitor that behavior, hopefully change that process, and then look for other deviations out there. And I think that's the, the big piece that you know, Ty was hit on early on, is, is trying to address those types of concerns. Thank you very much. So, just one more, th just kidding. No, I, absolutely. So, so with that, I, I would like to introduce uh, Paul Thames. He's the uh, practice lead for our remediation services at Trusted Sec. So you know, if we come out and um, you know, we do a framework assessment, or we do a pen test, or whatever we may do, and when we have findings and, and someone's looking for you know, help with implementing those things and, and building out a program, that's where uh, you get to uh, uh, talk to Paul. And uh, it is his birthday today, just throwing that in there. So I'll stand up, is that okay? Please do, please do. Thanks. So uh, I'll get to, no, yeah. <laughs> it's my twin brother's birthday too, so double, double the pleasure there. All right, so um, <laughs> let, I'm gonna stand up just because it's a little more comfortable for me. Uh, trusted Sec, uh, our remediation life cycle. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is what we're actually seeing after the, the team goes in there and they do a pen test and it's like, oh my gosh, everything is, is bad, right? They got in, in in like 15 seconds, maybe 16 seconds, but they get in there and there's all these things that have to take place. There's these group policies that haven't been applied. There's all of these things. And so what we're looking at is something happened, whether you got a, uh, hey, we have to meet this uh, contract. To meet this contract, we have to have a pen test done. Something happened. Maybe you just got through, you had a uh, Tyler's team come in there because you had an incident. Something just happened and there's now executive focus and that's a great time to strike. So when you have the executives aware of the problem and they're willing to spend the money on it, don't you know, say, oh, okay, now I'm gonna try to defend myself. And this is why we did what we did and start complaining, leverage it. And so say, hey, we have this thing, we now have executive focus, let's get in there. The next thing that happens is, is we 
now have to do a reality check. We have to go in there and we have to actually see what's going on in our environment. Next slide. Uh, that's where traditionally security assessment work takes place. And that's typically kind of where it ends too. If we go to the next one, the, from that, after that pen test has been done, after we figured out, hey, we should be implementing these group policies, we should do the application whitelisting, we should be you know, changing our password policies, you get this list of maybe 100 or 200 things to do, and most IT people are like, well, I got so much free time, I can just do this, right? No, of course not, no one has any time. And it's things that you never have to do again. So a lot of the things that we run into, these recommendations are one-time um, initial things that are complex, but you don't do it every day, right? So I, what I'm running into is I'm running into very seasoned systems administrators, very seasoned systems engineers inside of large organizations that only have to have maybe implemented multi-factor authentication one time six years ago or maybe they've only had to do mess with their group policy uh, specifically in this area one time in the past five years. And so we're finding there's a list of things that are relatively straightforward to do, the basics, but people don't do them every day. They're worried about the ERP system implementation, right? And they're worried about the business intelligence initiative and that Internet of Things uh, project that's going on that products are developing the product development team is working on it, how do we secure that? That's what they're worried about. And sometimes these basics, they get rusty at them. So what we do is we help with transition services and what we're seeing is this is really, really helpful to our clients and to you. Because you have this burden of all of these things that are coming on your back to say, oh my gosh, here's all of these things we have to get done with that we weren't expecting, that we didn't really budget time for, we help you with that. And so what we've, what we've seen very successfully is to be able to take all of those things, come up with an organized plan, if you go to the next slide, and work on remediating those issues. Whether it's detected through um, a pen test or maybe it's detected through vision, we can then come in there and help you develop a, a clean way of, of uh, reducing that risk of those vulnerabilities and those other issues. One of the things that um, happens there is we actually help you cut through the red tape. And a lot of the, the, the points are not, we're, we don't start with technology, we start with the most important thing, which is the people component of it, right? All of this security work that we're doing has so much to do with the human factor, right? We need to understand from an executive level, from an end user level, and everyone in between, the human factor. So as Tyler was talking, he's spending a lot of his time dealing with the people side of it, right? I mean, and that's what we're dealing with. A lot of times security starts and ends with people. Uh, so we spend time with what's going on in the environment with the people. Second, we take a look at their processes. What got them to this state? What can we do to prevent this going forward? And then we take a look at the tools that they're using and we start building in ways to resolve that. Um, you have to look at it in that order. Um, I can tell you um, my my history is I've been in uh, executive IT roles. I've been um, working for a large MSP. I, I, I've been around IT for a while. And I've been with lots of customers, probably hundreds of different customers that I've been at. And there's two things, there's a, there's a big differentiator between what I would call people that successfully implement and uh, run IT and those who don't. One of the things that I found is that when you start with technology, First, you have pretty much a failed deployment. You have lots of problems in the environment. When you start with people first, you usually have a very, very successful IT organization. I'll give you a quick example. Um, I can't give any names, but there was a large uh, multi-million dollar um, public entity. Let's leave it at that. Um, they had gotten a grant for a lot of technology, a lot of it. <laughs> Uh, many millions of dollars of technology, and they bought technology. They had rooms full of this, literally rooms full of technology. But they forgot about two other things, how they're gonna use it, and the people that were actually gonna use it. And surprise, not surprisingly to me, they had a lot of problems in their organization, both with the technology itself and with the organization achieving their goals. They were not meeting their goals, they were actually in a, not receivership, but a, a challenging situation. 
On the opposite side of that, I can tell you I've been in organizations where the focus is about the people. And the focus is about how do we go ahead and make this a better place? How do we figure out how to give the people the right processes so they know what they're doing? And then how do we back that up with tools? Those organizations that don't have a lot of money, extremely su successful. Their environments are secure. People are calling them up and saying, hey, I saw this this take place, there's an openness, there's communications, things like that. So a lot of what we do is we help make sure that all of those three elements are in place. So um, the last thing, that's what we do, and then we help support. I think, do I have one more slide? I do have one more slide. Engagement life cycle, it's pretty straightforward. Why don't we go through all four of those, load them up there, there we go, because I don't want to run out of too much time, and I'm, I'm almost out of jokes. So. You're good, and that's why I can help you with the jokes if you okay, need it. Cool. So we do, <laughs> so what we want to do real quick, when we do help you solve these problems, we don't just want to flick switches, right? So we don't want to start with technology and just say, hey, we're going to come in here, great example, hey, our password policy uh, is, is messed up, right? It's, it's eight characters, it's simple. What we're going to do is we're just going to deploy a new password policy. How, how great is that going to go over? I've seen that happen. Someone downloads the the CIS standards or the NIST standards, and they're like, hey, we're just gonna deploy this group policy that says that characters have to be uh, uh, 12, 12, whatever, 14, some random number that they, they choose, and it has to be complex, and they do turn it on. Well, now you have literally 4,000 people, I've seen it with 4,000 people, not able to log in. Because they didn't take it from the right step. Okay, well, how is this gonna affect people? What is the process to communicate? And then let's install the group policy. They do it in the opposite order, and they get in trouble. So we like to follow a step where we make sure we're all on the same page. Um, that's our inception phase. Make sure we know all the details, those three components, what's gonna be affected from a people, a process, and a tools perspective. Then we actually do the work, and then we make sure that it's actually implemented the right way. So. It's interesting, uh, I, I've known Paul for, for a number of years. Uh, Paul, I think, was actually my second or third customer I ever worked on when I first got out of the military back in like 2005 uh, when you were over at Vitamix. Yeah. And uh, I think I found a bunch of zero days in, in that oh, Grand yeah. Rapids software too. Yeah, That's yeah. a lot of fun. Um, but anyways, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that we we saw and th that that was a, a media problem for us is that you would we go into customers all the time, and we just blow them up. You know, we we'd, we'd find all these issues, we'd find all these areas, we'd get access to all their data, and then we produce a report and we communicate that report. You know, we we work with them and try to make sure that they understand the findings. But then the next year, they might have fixed the technical findings, but they never actually addressed why those findings were there in the first place. Yeah. And they had a lot of trouble with that. And so, you know, with, with Paul, it was really to come in and, and with the mentality of always, you know, making the world a better place, of helping people um, fix and address those issues more programmatically than, than not. Um, and that's been really effective for a lot of our, our customers and something that, that is absolutely needed. I mean, I, there's only so many times you can go in and blow somebody up before they're like, hey, I'm tired of being blown up here, you know, before, before getting better. Um, you know, we want to make sure that, that people are actually getting yeah. better with what they're doing. Yeah, and, using, and also using those tools that you already have invested in, kind of like we talked about. You need to, usually, yes, you may have to buy a tool, but leverage what's already there. So many times we have the shelfware, so many times we have the tools that um, are available to us and we don't use them. And again, that's not a tool problem. It starts with the people. Like, do we have the right mentality? Do we have the processes in place? Do we have the plans in place? And then let's use the tools. Thanks. So good. So one of the things we want to do, I'm going to kind of wander out and uh, take questions that we can uh, address to the panel or otherwise. Um, yeah, and one of the things we want to mention too is, so we do a lot of presentations. We do a lot of webinars, a lot of blogs, things like that. So one of our goals, you know, is, is always to kind of make sure we are giving back to the community and, and sharing knowledge. So please avail yourself of that. So any questions right now? Who wants to be first? Come on. So this question goes back to, to Todd um, early on. Um, you had indicated that you had done queries in that like at midnight and then you, you look at them the next day and so forth. Can you give us kind of some general ideas as to what type of queries that you're posting that, that run at midnight? Oh, maybe I didn't explain that uh, clearly. We weren't running the queries, the, the potential customer, the client was running the queries. To put it to put it in perspective, like uh, w with with looking at specific queries and trying to understand like what's happening out there, the customer was basically running customized queries and getting an email delivered to them, uh, you know, to, to be more responsive. What we do is we look at it all the time, right? So the, the queries that you would look for, I mean, we can give examples for sure. 
um, on those. Um, but you know, like uh, looking for unusual um, IP addresses, com command and control, uh, beacon intervals, um, uh, PowerShell commands, uh, length of PowerShell commands, uh, specific binaries that have network communications that you wouldn't typically see, like CertUtil, um, MabInject, uh, RegSphere32, MSHTA, um, looking for those types of binaries that have um, communications that you typically wouldn't want to see uh, in the past. Um, you know, uh, being able to do uh, cross comparisons with uh, known specific um, hashes and, and things like that uh, across your environment. Uh, and, and you too, I'm sure, can provide a lot more than, than I can on that. But well, yeah, I was also going to say, you know, um, other reports I've seen uh, run sim <coughs> excuse me, similarly are looking at uh, statistics over the last 24 hours. So, you know, failed logins over the last 24 hours. You know, who were your top you know, failed logins, who was uh, getting blocked uh, on your proxy server or, or your DNS going to, trying to go to malicious sites. You know, you, you might not see those. I, if you took it in, in very small time slices, you might not, they may not trigger anything, but when you look at it over a 24-hour a, uh, period, you know, you could see that, you know, Bob in sales, uh, every 20 minutes was trying to go to this malicious website and was getting blocked, but that, why was he trying to go every 20 minutes to this malicious website? There, there's still something going on there. So how many people here are going to go back and fire Bob in sales? <laughs> so. um, application whitelisting was mentioned as an important tool, and I've heard that before. To, we found it to be a challenge to try to put in place. Uh, the flip side of that you mentioned, and it's an upcoming trend, is the living off the land type of attacks. It is it expected there's going to be some tipping point where application whitelisting won't be as good of a tool because of that, and if so, any guess on when that tipping point would occur? That's a that's a great question, uh, and I think that's that's really relevant. It's something that that I don't think a lot of people look forward on. Uh, application whitelisting stops a large percentage of the commoditized attacks that we see out there today. Uh, but when you start looking at a lot of the targeted attacks that we see, especially living off the land binaries and scripts that are code signed, um, these types of techniques circumvent application whitelisting uh, and, and because they're leveraging legitimate Windows binaries to conduct operations that get to code execution onto the systems. Um, I still think that from a, a coverage perspective, application whitelisting uh, probably has the best clip for reducing your, your immediate noise and threat that you have out there. And then looking and, and leveraging monitoring and detection for a way to, to identify those unusual behaviors and move off of those is, is important. There are ways of leveraging application control um, to uh, prohibit uh, living up land binaries and scripts as well. Most of them, if you look at the 77 or so um, that are out there, most of them, if not 95% of them, don't need to ever be run by a regular user account. Um, so you look at like RegSVR32, MSHTA, uh, CBD, CSC, Mavinject, uh, BG Info, a lot of these are, are, are specific applications that a regular user doesn't actually need to ever in any way, shape, or form have to run on their system. It's a normal operating system level um, application, but a regular user does not. So you can still leverage application control to say, hey, here's a list of all these living off the land binaries and scripts. Disallow them from regular users from being able to run, only allow administrators or system level accounts to, to effectively do it. So you can still leverage um, application control uh, to, to go and do those. Uh, one thing that we do um, over at Binary Defense um, is, is we continuously maintain a list of all those living off the land binaries and scripts looking for, for unusual behaviors with them, either, either them being run in the first place or them leveraging with network communications or them leveraging with specific patterns. Um, and then you know, we have you know, alarms that, that get triggered and our, our analysts actively go and, and identify those. And if those machines are identified as compromised, can move those machines in containment to, to remove those. So you know, preventative and detective can be a very effective control uh, for a lot of those living off the land binaries and scripts. And we're seeing more and more, you know, more of the organized crime, uh, folks with more resources and capabilities, um, nation states obviously, leveraging more and more of those um, all the time. So it's becoming more and more prominent. There's a lot of research in there happening all the time uh, around there, both in the security community and in the attacker community, the hacking community um, around those. So, you know, I think application control can still be an effective method in those areas. Good, good, good question. And it's very difficult to implement, by the way. I, I, I feel your pain. It's tough, you know, if, and no one here that I know of has standardized images across their entire environment with no deviations or, you know, anything like that across, the, you know, it just doesn't happen, right? So, you know, having application whitelisting go into an environment that has changes that happen all the time becomes extremely difficult. And then, you know, I think servers actually are probably one of the easiest to do because you can kind of control the standardization configurations of those and the process that you do. But when it comes to your endpoints and your workstations, which are your highest probability of attack, 
that's when it starts to get extremely challenging uh, within your, your organization environments, and that's where application control is a big overhaul within with how you're doing things. You stress the importance of active threat intel research, uh, getting into forums, here, there, dark web, that kind of stuff, making friends with bad guys. How do you get started doing that kind of thing? Where do you find your first resource to dive in and start spreading out from? I think the, the biggest area, and I can talk to some of this, um, you know, having folks that, that come from the, the military intelligence side and kind of how those operate was very effective for us early on. Um, but, I, but I do think, you know, if you look at, at how the dark web structured, you know, going into the forums and sites and, 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 and just starting to, to talk to folks in a way that allows you to kind of associate with different groups, um, providing things uh, that, that doesn't help the bad folks, but gets you into a level of understanding and knowledge that allows them into certain groups, and then from there you kind of spread out, I think is important. Um, you know, it, and it's, 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 it's really, you're, you're running intelligence operations, uh, more counterintel to, to understand what's going on, but you're, you're doing it in a way that, that isn't helping and assisting bad folks with doing bad things. You don't want to provide malware. Uh, you don't want to write new code for them. Uh, but having a good level of understanding and, and buying things in, in certain cases may help out. Um, very gray line there. Um, to, to try to, to get into their, their trusted circle to kind of focus on them and work with them, uh, I think is some of the big areas. But the forums provided a good, good realm for us. Um, you know, looking at the, the breach sites, the database dumps, um, those can help out a lot as well. Um, just getting into that environment, I think, is, is where we had a lot of success early on with it. Any more questions? I, I usually plant a question, which is how can I learn more about your products and services? But uh, I, I did not do that today. So anybody else? Okay. One thing I want to say before we wrap up, I just want to thank everybody uh, for coming out here and taking time out every day. I know everybody's busy. I'm sure none of us, uh, I'm sure all of us have enough resources uh, dedicated to security and IT. Uh, you know, that's why we're here, because all of your folks are, are doing awesome stuff back at, back at your work. Uh, but you know, as you can see here, uh, you know, the, the purpose of this was knowledge sharing and transfer. Uh, and you know, when I started Trust at Sec, when I started Binary Defense, it was really uh, to bring good folks to help people with the challenges that they have out there. And this isn't a sales pitch in any way, it's just we want to make the world a better place. And, and the team that we have here, I mean, most of the folks here I've worked with in some capacity for, for 10 or 15 years. Uh, as I mentioned, Paul, Alex, Alex and I worked uh, at a, a previous former life uh, working at a different different organization. Dave, I hired in from uh, Progressive uh, over, over oh, am, I supposed to say, am I supposed to say it? You just met me? Um, you know, I, back in 2000, like, eight or nine, uh, and, and so I've been working Tyler. I, I, I've been trying to hire Tyler since I started Trust at Second. He finally came over to the dark side. So, um, you know, we just have good folks here that we really try to, uh, to bring uh, uh, forward. Great amount of folks uh, trying to help you out. If you're interested in what we're doing, you know, on the managed endpoint detection response or monitoring your infrastructure, a lot of things that we talked about today, you know, around understanding threats, understanding how attackers are, are, are getting into your infrastructure, threat intelligence, you know, managing that whole security piece there. We do that over a binary defense. We, we monitor for those threats. We, we monitor for the living off the land binaries and scripts, the compromised accounts. We have folks looking at glass 24 seven, you know, helping you respond and address those, those specific issues. You know, uh, Ed had the, the comment over there around uh, antivirus replacements and, and being able to go around that. I mean, we, we have a solution that can help simplify a lot of those, the, those different things there all the way to our teams helping you advise and address and remediate the issues, uh, finding your flaws and everything else. So great team, uh, and hopefully you know, I see a lot of our customers here, so appreciate your continued support and, and growing uh, trusted second binary defense. Uh, uh, thank you all for coming out. Really appreciate it.